Thank you very much, uh, James. In, in contrast to what we've been hearing um, interesting things last, last couple of days on translation, uh, what I'm going to tell you seems to be a little bit more technical or even mechanical because it's, uh, it's about a framework and a framework uh, on, uh, about uh, education and training for literary translators and uh, frameworks should work, okay? Uh, uh, I know some people who developed other frameworks and uh, they say, leave me alone with, with my framework, I, I, I don't need it anymore. But I think we are going, to, we are going for it and uh, we hope that one day the framework will really work so I will, I will talk to you about, uh, well, what, what, what I uh, would like to say uh, as, as an introduction still, it, it seems technical or mechanical, but as soon as, uh, as you start asking questions about, for example, the underlying concept of translation in this framework, or as soon as you start asking what can this framework mean for Bible translation, what I've been doing the last couple of weeks, questions come up and critical questions come up uh, with me. So, for example, I was, I was reading this very interesting book on uh, translating sensitive texts, and sensitive texts, for example, uh, uh, are Bible texts or sacred texts are sensitive texts, but also literary texts, so there, there's a connection. Uh, but if you, if you look at the definition of sensitive texts and you look at, uh, at the way uh, uh, in, in, in the framework, the way in which they're texts are, are approached, there is some difference and, and there, is, there are some critical questions to ask. If you, if you start from, from, uh, from this book, I think you, you couldn't develop a framework like this. So, so that's, that's, these are, are critical questions. So it's interesting. Um, anyway, so what I would like to talk to you uh, uh, about today is, uh, is this framework. So why, why uh, it came into being, how we did it. I will present it to you. Uh, I, will, I will mention some, some critical points. So uh, I think uh, some uh, things are, uh, are lacking and uh, there are some shortcomings still in the, in the framework. And I will give some thoughts on uh, on how to adapt, possibly adapt this framework to Bible translation, and uh, we can discuss uh, this one. If you have questions, you may interrupt me uh, at any time. Okay. So the, the Petra uh, story is uh, is a long story. In fact, it started uh, uh, 2011, and, and the preparation even 2009, I believe. Uh, but 2011 was the it was a big Petra conference. Petra means the Plateforme Européenne pour la Traduction Littéraire. And uh, I was in the preparation of, of that too. And um, uh, we brought together all kind of uh, agents in literary translation. So not only translators, but also people involved in education, uh, publishers, um, uh, all, all kind of, of people around literary translation and we discussed for three days uh, on what, what could be done to the, to the rather uh, uh, well precarious situation of literary translation uh, as well as what, what financial uh, aspects of, of the thing are that uh, literary translation, uh, translators don't earn very much uh, and also the, the connection to publishers is, n is not that good. And uh, so there were only problems, uh, it seemed. And uh, we, uh, we, we thought about how, how can we make things better? And uh, out of that emerged uh, in 2012, this um, uh, this brochure towards new conditions. It, oh, here it is. Uh, towards new conditions for literary translation uh, you can find it on the, on the internet towards new conditions for literary translation in Europe and uh, the Petra recommendations, see? And 
uh, in, in it there is a, a kind of diagnosis of the situation of uh, literary translators. Um, and these are the main points in that. Uh, uh, there is, of course, no existing framework for the education of literary translators as there is for, for more general translators, for technical translators or law translators. So there, are, there are existing uh, frameworks for that. I will show uh, some of them in a moment. Uh, but there are uh, lots of initiatives uh, uh, for the education and training of literary translators all over Europe, academic and non-academic. There are a lot of uh, master degrees, meanwhile, in, in Europe. But there are also a lot of uh, summer courses and all kinds of organizations who organize uh, courses uh, uh, in literary translation, uh, not only in Europe, but all over the world, in, in fact. They deal with different traditions and, uh, and different approaches to, uh, to, uh, to the education of literary translation and to the concept of literary translation itself. So there is a, a, a widespread didactic competence, uh, but it is shattered. It is, it is, it's, it's all, over, all over Europe, and we wanted to bring people together and think about how, to, how, how can we do it uh, properly. Especially uh, felt was the need for um, uh, uh, a structural collaboration between academic and non-academic institutions and, uh, and with the working field with translators and publishers, uh, in fact. And that is still a weak point, I think. It's, uh, it's something that, that hasn't been realized uh, up to now. But uh, we'll, we hope we, because in, in these courses, we have to work with people from the field who are not, who don't have an academic degree uh, sometimes, or mostly. So that is a, that is a, a structural problem. We have some experiences, and I, and I think uh, uh, you have them too. Uh, the career of a literary translator is unpredictable. You can't, uh, nobody, uh, well, nobody says, I'm, I'm going to be a literary translator. So I, I'm going for it. And th there's, a, there's a pathway to, literary to, to become a literary translator. It doesn't. Yeah? They all have slipped, the, the translators I know, all have slipped at a certain moment of their life into literary translation. You know? uh, at the moment they started it and, uh, and, have, and they continued uh, doing it and that's the, that's the way to do it. So meanwhile, there are uh, uh, courses and, and, and master courses and uh, programs. So meanwhile, you can plan your career uh, in literary translation, but most of them uh, uh, haven't. Uh, in, in our expertise center for literary translation, um, when we organize, call, when we offer courses, the average age of the people coming there is, uh, is over 40. So that's not, that's not the age uh, to start a, a, a career properly. So, but this is, this is a fact. You know? uh, most people are, uh, uh, have, have done something else. They, they, they were in, uh, in a school or uh, and were disappointed in what they were doing and, and hoped that uh, in literary translation they, they can do something more useful uh, for, for themselves and for others. I think this is changing now. Uh, when, when I look at the courses, I think they, they might be somewhat younger now, uh, but still it's, uh, it's uh, well, uh, over, over 30, but uh, figures are, are, are clear. And also here we have a diversity uh, when it comes to, to the, to the uh, uh, participants in the courses, they have, they, there's a lot of diversity in, uh, in experience and competence. You know, they, they all come from different backgrounds and uh, some know a, a liter a literature very well. They, they know this, they have, they have read everything. Others haven't and uh, also their competencies. They, for example, their, their translation competence or transfer competence is, is sometimes very good, sometimes very weak. Uh, it's, it's all different. So uh, this, is, this, is, uh, this is the background. There's, uh, there's a, a, a complete diversity in, in experience and competence. And what we need uh, is uh, a, a tool to estimate these needs, to, to estimate what, what do you need, in fact. Your, uh, this one needs that, this one, uh, the other one needs something else. So we, we need a tool to estimate 
the, the needs uh, and, and of course then develop the corresponding uh, training and education uh, for, for them. Another experience, and um, uh, I don't know what you think about that, but the, the didactical model we often meet when we engage people from the field is that of the master-pupil uh, 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 relationship. So you have the experienced translator who tells his pupil, this is the way to do it, and you can copy that, and then you're a good translator. So, but uh, we feel that that doesn't work anymore. That's, uh, that's, that's, that's not not good enough, yeah, okay? Uh, you must be more, there must be more differentiation in the, in the, in the, in the techniques of, 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 uh, of educating and, uh, and training. So, uh, and therefore I think uh, a, a concept of, uh, of, of competence-based uh, uh, education is much more uh, open uh, and much more apt to to these to these experiences, because uh, what what do you do when when somebody is coming there and uh, has has uh, some experience, and on the other side there is this coach who has a lot of experience, and uh, so it, it it doesn't match really well. So uh, the coach has to think about the needs of the of the pupil and not sit there and say I'm, I'm I know what I'm doing. That's that's uh, I I know what what translation is. I know what literary translation is. I've been doing it all my life and, and just, just copy what I'm doing. That's, 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 not, that's not good, it's not working. Okay. We had to develop this in the Expertise Center for Literary Translation too because in, when we organize a course and there, there are uh, normally for three or four languages into Dutch and uh, in, every, in every course there are, uh, there are some 10 people perhaps and they're all different. So we have to think about it. How, how can we meet their individual needs? So, and and you, can't, you can't meet them by, by uh, putting some experienced translator before them and, and, and have to tell them so. So in the Petrarch recommendations, you can read that it is recommended to create open structures at national and European level to enable universities and higher education establishments to collaborate with non-academic organizations and associations and networks of professional literary translators without cumbersome administrative procedures. That's a nice goal, but uh, we haven't realized uh, anything about that. Another recommendation is, uh, it is recommended to start a discussion on promising long-term structures for the education and training of literary translators at the European level. This involves the exchange and cooperation between academic and non-academic institutions, again, on the contents of training, on practical issues and methods of teaching. Okay. And the third one, a, re a representative working group should work out a proposal based on already existing initiatives. One of the items on the agenda could be the development of a learning line, we called it a learning line, for literary translators with a distinct sequence of steps from beginners to professional translators, including the training of translators willing to transfer their knowledge and skills. Okay. That's the idea. So that's the idea where Petra E came from then. There are some, uh, as I told you, there are existing frameworks. Uh, for example, uh, we have the, uh, uh, the EMT, I, I will show it uh, after this, and, and especially the PACTE uh, group in uh, Barcelona who, is, uh, who has been do doing uh, quite some work on, uh, on developing a really uh, working framework, you know, well, a framework with all the components in it. Um, and uh, I show you, you, you can go to, the, this is an interesting website, um, uh, the Pacte Group. Uh, my, my, my Spanish is too poor, but uh, you can, or, or my, my uh, it's not Spanish, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, Catalan. Yeah. <laughs> You see the, the word uh, evaluation uh, in translation uh, and we will talk about that uh, later on also. But what they are trying to do is uh, to develop a framework 
with an evaluation system. Uh, they, they, uh, they try to, to, uh, to look at all the competencies a translator needs and uh, then uh, uh, connect to it also an evaluation system. Uh, when somebody has acquired these, uh, these uh, competencies, he has to prove uh, that he has acquired them. And that's what they're trying to do. It's very interesting there. Um, this is their uh, competence model. I'm, I, I'm not going uh, into it. Uh, it's, uh, we can talk endlessly about these schemes, but um, you see there's only one uh, central competence. It's the strategic uh, subcompetence uh, sub to, to which all other competences refer. This is the EMT model. It's the, it's the model that was developed for the European Masters in Translation, so for general translation or for specific translation. And here you see that there is also a central uh, competence, uh, namely translation service provision. So they, they start from the, from the vision that uh, translation is some kind of, uh, of a service to, to a client. And how can you service the client? How, how can, you, can you offer the best service to your client? And the other competencies are, are then language, intercultural, info mining, technological, and thematic. So, okay. Can I have, uh, it is interesting, and I'll come back to it uh, later on, uh, because uh, you can find it also on the internet the European Masters in Translation Competence Framework. Um, uh, interesting is, I, sh I will show you, they have, okay, this philosophy of competence and skill and knowledge, uh, and they distinguish, later in the brochure, they distinguish, where is it, here all these um, uh, sub-competences, and they have only 36, they have 35 even, well, they have 35 sub-competences. So they esteem that with these 35 competences or descriptors of, of competences, you are a good, a good translator. You are not, well, let's talk about it later on. It's an interesting discussion. You are a competent translator. Yeah? We can only hope that a competent translator will also be a good translator. There's a big difference. Uh, but uh, they have 35. In our framework, we have, uh, 126 uh, uh, descriptors. Well, the, a little bit of a history. The first draft of, uh, of a learning line for literary translators was in fact made by the Expertise Center for Literary Translation. So I, I did it with a colleague of mine. We, we uh, distinguished already eight main competencies and we had 56 descriptors instead of 126. And it was unilinear. That means we, we didn't distinguish levels. So now we have five levels. Uh, we called it a learning line, and the learning line, in fact, presupposes levels. So that's, that's, why, that's, that's why here we, are, we have five levels and eight competencies. So that's, uh, that's, that comes from this first uh, draft of the... Of, uh, of the framework. Well, then uh, we 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 sat together and uh, 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 tried to apply for a, a European project, a Erasmus Plus project, and we had eight European partners: uh, the Dutch Language Union, which is a, a Flemish and Dutch Flemish Dutch uh, uh, organization uh, for the for the for the Dutch language in the world. Uh, we had the University of Utrecht in Holland, uh, the University of Leuven in, in Belgium. We had the BCLT and East, University of East Anglia. We had the LT University in uh, Budapest and, uh, and uh, Fondazione here in uh, Misano. So these were the academic partners in the, in the project. And then we had uh, the DUF, the Deutsche Übersetzerfonds, which is the organization that uh, gathers the, the German uh, translators, not only literary translators, but also other 
and the Literarisches Colloquium Berlin, which is uh, part of the DÜF, and the Bund Deutscher Übersetzer, who are also part of the, of the project. Uh, and we had the CEATL, which is the European Association of Associations of Translators, yeah? Conférence Européenne d'Association de Traducteurs Littéraires. They represent the, the, the practical field, the, 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 the field of practical translators. Okay? And they are asking for these, for these commodities to, to engage non-academic people in, in academia, which is different, uh, difficult. So you, you can see we have academic and non-academic participants. There is this academic discourse on translation, and there is the discourse of practical translators on translation, and there is a big tension yeah, between that. There's still a, a great deal of suspicion uh, among uh, practical translators towards uh, the, uh, theory in, uh, in academia. They still suspect us that we will prescribe them how to translate, which I, I, I don't see, but uh, uh, the, the, the suspicion is there still. But I think we, 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 we managed to overcome th this, this kind of tension, I think, uh, Roberta, in the, in the, uh, during the project. And it's, it's better now. And therefore, because of this tension, we had to create, and, and also for other reasons, I think, we had to create what we call an open network, a network that is not putting some, uh, some obligation on, on others. It's, uh, it's totally open. Um, uh, for example, uh, you have the possibility to add new competences or descriptors if you, if you feel the need, and it's, it's not closed. Uh, or it is the there is a possibility always to create a pathway through the, through the framework. Yes, you, can, you, can, you can make your own way. Well, yeah, to me, there are no prescriptions in the, in the framework and no setting of norms. There are no norms in it. Uh, there, there's not one descriptor who is uh, telling you how to translate. Okay. So I think, it, I think it's not theory or agenda driven, but we can discuss on that. Uh, okay. Now this, this Petra E framework is a competence framework. So the, the, the central uh, concept is competence. Yeah, okay. it, is a, it is in fact a combination of a competence model like EMT or like PACTE and a learning line. So we, we, we combine these eight competencies and uh, five levels in a, in a kind of, of, of learning line. For me, this has always been uh, uh, a source of tension within the framework. Because of this idea of competence, uh, uh, we understand by competence a constellation of knowledge, skills, and attitudes. These three, right? you, have, you, have, you know something, you can do something with this knowledge, you have the skill to apply this knowledge, and you have a certain attitude within, within a professional uh, context. The EMT, and I agree with, what their, with their definition, they define competence as uh, competence is the proven ability, and this word proven, I will come back to that, ability to use knowledge, skills, and personal, social, and or uh, methodological abilities in work and study situations and in professional and personal development. That's their definition of competence, and uh, it's a nice one. Very, very important, and this is, this is fundamental, uh, competences are properties of persons, of translators, not of translations. You don't have competent translations. You, have, you only can have uh, uh, competent translators. So. They are properties of persons, not of products, okay? Another, uh, I would say, property of, of competence is, and that's, the, that's this word proven, competences are or should be objectively testable. Yeah? Well, you, you, you should prove in, a, in, a, in an objective way that you have acquired a certain competence, okay? Product, products are only accessible on the basis of norms. There are, uh, to me, there are no uh, objective methods 
to judge the quality of a translation. They don't exist. It's an eternal discussion on what is a good translation. And uh, it, it depends on the norms uh, you apply on the, on the translation. Okay? Whereas uh, a, a, a competence, the, the question whether somebody knows something and is able to apply this knowledge, that you can test, you can, you can assess, uh, you can find some kind of an assessment that in an objective way says, okay, you have this competence. Okay? And that's, the, that's one of, the, one of the, the problems, I think, within the world of, of literary translation, because the quality of a translator in literary translation is always being assessed by the quality of the product. In, in the discussion about the quality of a translator is always about the quality of his product. Of course, there's, there's some reason in that, there's some rationale in that. But uh, I think it's, it's, not, uh, it's not fair, yeah, okay? It's, uh, uh, you can, we, we talked about it yesterday uh, uh, on the bike, uh, Michael, when, when, you have, uh, when, when you ask a translator in, in, an, in an exam to translate a text of 250 words, he has an enormous uh, uh, amount of possible failures he can make. You, you can make at least 250 failures against the words that are in the text, uh, let alone all the things around the text. So uh, this is not fair vis-a-vis -vis the, the translator. You know? uh, so you have to do it in another way, we felt, okay? So that's, that's uh, this, in, uh, well, I, I'm engaged in the literary world and, and for example, the, the Dutch Literary Fund asks me to assess translations. They sent me a translation. I don't know who, who the translator was. It's anonymous. And they, they tell me, can you say something about the quality of the translation? Yeah. And they needed to assess this translator who receives money when I say the translation is good. So by the quality of his translations or her translations, uh, I decide whether he or she receives the money. Okay, that's not fair either, I think. Okay, but it's a, bit, a big discussion. This is, uh, uh, this is important also for uh, uh, when, when we have the question of uh, can we apply this framework to Bible translation? This is the way we were, we were, uh, we were going on, we were starting it and, 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 and we were looking how can we how, how can we develop this. So the first step was distinguishing and naming the different competencies. It's something like an exercise that uh, I think that uh, that an analyst uh, in, in in some company, in, in, uh, a computer analyst, has to do when uh, some kind of a process must must be automatized. Yeah? You see, you think what 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 are the elements in it? You know? So we, we have been thinking of what, is, what, is, what does a, a translator need in, uh, in, in, when it comes to knowledge and it, when it comes to skills. So we just thought and thought. And we came to these eight competencies. These are the eight, the eight fields of, uh, of, uh, of competence. Then you have to define them. You have to define them. Uh, what, what is meant by these competencies? And the third step, and that's... that's uh, it's even more uh, important. W you have to describe these competences by means of descriptors. Okay, so there's there's in in our uh, um, uh, framework there is some synthetic um, synthetic definition of the of every competence. Yeah, but in fact the the real definition or the real description of the competence is this one. Yes, is are, are all these uh, descriptors together? So the first uh, transfer competence is in fact uh, uh, defined by all this, all these, these I don't know how many, twenty descriptors. Okay. This is all done. So we have distinguished the competencies, we have defined them, and we have described them by means of uh, of uh, descriptors. What we haven't done yet is connecting behavioral indicators 
to these descriptors. So uh, when, you, when you say uh, you must be able to, to analyze a text, then you have to, to connect to that a, a behavioral descriptor uh, defining the behavior the person shows when analyzing a text. Because otherwise it is not accessible, it's not testable. Okay? These behavioral indicators must be objectively observable and in, in, the, in, the, in an ideal sense dichotomically scorable. That means he has it or he, has, he doesn't. Okay? Yes or no. Yeah? Okay. And the, the fifth step, and also that is not yet uh, developed, uh, develop valid and reliable instruments of assessments, of assessment. So instruments that, that test what you are saying you will test, valid, and instruments that don't depend on the circumstances uh, you, you use them, uh, reliable, and not on the persons. I think we all know that uh, when you, when you when, when, when people read a translation and are asked to say something about the translation, they say different things. It's not the, 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 the reliability of, uh, of uh, uh, some... Uh, when, 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 when you have to read a, a, a translation in order to evaluate it, the reliability is very, very low, very low. And it is mostly done on an intersubjective way. So, for example, these funds, they ask two different people, not knowing each other, what do we think about this translation? And, and results may be, may be contrasting. To have a reliable results on an intersubjective basis, I think you need, you need at least some 50, some 50 readers of the translation. Then it starts getting reliable, but not earlier. Okay. Well, the, uh, as, as you have, you can see all, in, 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 we have eight competencies, the transfer competence, the language competence, the textual competence, the heuristic competence, the literary cultural competence, professional competence, evaluative competence, and research competence. There were big discussions on uh, uh, we agreed immediately, I think, on the first five competencies. But uh, that, uh, it was funny that professional translators said, we, you, you, you don't need this professional competence to become a good translator. Uh, you grow into it, you, you don't need that. You don't, you don't need to, to know how to get subsidies or uh, you don't need to know what publishers publish, what kind of books, etc. Uh, you don't need that. They said that. We think you need that, as a, as a, as a, especially as a young translator. And uh, the, the resistance to evaluative competence and research competence was even bigger. Okay? It's, uh, uh, why, why, why have a research competence in, in translation to, when, when you're a practical translator? We think it's, uh, when, when, when becoming a literary translator is, is a matter of, of a master in translation uh, and literary translation, you should be able to research, to, to do research on, uh, on, s on several things. So we put it in. And these five levels, beginner, advanced learner, early career professional, advanced professional, and, and expert. Um, when it comes to these levels, we had, uh, we had discussions on uh, what, 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 is, what is the, the you know, what in, in terms of bachelor and master, where would you situate that? Okay? And we think that uh, for the most European countries, LT1 is the bachelor level. Okay? And uh, LT2 is master level. But it may, it may differ in, uh, in several countries and LT3 and 5 to 5 are professional levels. So then you are outside uh, and still learning, but as a professional, okay? Now our framework um, is meant as an analytic instrument. It's not synthetic, you know? We don't, we don't uh, uh, have a, a comprehensive literary translation competence. We don't say 
when you when you have all of this, you are uh, uh, you are a competent literary translator. But we analyze it, and that's 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 the good thing about it. I, uh, I think uh, these these competencies are defined or or described by these descriptors, and you can you can analyze uh, elements of the of the of your competence. And it's it's not this this somewhat. Uh, that's an easy uh, uh, synthetic way of saying this is this is a, uh, a competent literary translator. And, an, and a, a third remark is that uh, there is no hierarchy uh, between these competencies. So we have the first is the transfer competence, but this doesn't mean that it's the most important one. Okay? So it depends on the kind of translator you want to be. I can't imagine a translator who is uh, doing research and uh, for him the, the eighth competence is, uh, is perhaps the, the most important one. And starting from that, he, he goes to, to a more practical uh, way of doing, okay? So no hierarchy. That's the difference between EMT and Pakte. They, they have a central competence. What are the goals and, uh, and the possible uses of the framework? It is, of course, uh, useful to determine, to determine for, for uh, individual translators their level of proficiency. That's, what, that's the first thing I do with my students when, when, I, when I start a course. Uh, after the second or third session, I, I uh, give them the framework and I say, read it very carefully and think about it. And next time you tell me what, what, are your, what, what competences do you think you already have acquired and where are your weak points and what can we do? Yeah? But only after the second or third session, not, not at the beginning. That's, that's one of the, one of the and, and they like it. They, 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 they get a, a, some kind of an, it's a moment of reflection in their, in their, in their development and uh, it helps. And it helps also to see what, what, what do I have to do uh, still? What, what, what are my, my gaps in, the, in expertise? And that's one of the things we want to develop now, that is uh, to connect instruments, training instruments, to every, to every descriptor in the, in the framework. So when you, when you see, I, I, I need something about uh, using strategies, and, uh, so how can you how can you do that? How can you how can you choose the right strategy for a certain text? And we have to think about instruments that 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 uh, teach uh, people how to do that. Okay, that will be the big work in the in the future, uh, I think. But you can also use this uh, framework for course design. I think it's uh, perhaps it's even more important than this individual use. Uh, when, you, when you develop your course, you can, you can say, okay, what, what am, I, am I going to do in this course? And what are the elements I want to stress or uh, I want them to learn? Um, I know in the beginning when I was starting uh, at, at, at our institute, I, in, in my translation course, literary trans I took a text, I read it, I said, oh, th these are interesting problems. Oh, yes, okay, it's, uh, it's fine to do. It's a nice text. It's uh, okay, let's do it. But uh, when you, now I look at the text and I try to define the, the elements in function of, of, of the descriptors in the framework. So you can, you can stress these learning moments much more than when you're taking just a, a random text and, uh, and translate it, okay? It's, uh, I think the learning effect is, uh, is much more stronger than when you take a, a text, a, a general text, and when you're lucky, they, oh yeah, well, okay, this is the way to do that. Now you stress, uh, the, the, or you, you concentrate on, uh, on, uh, on several uh, defined points in the, in the text, and, uh, and they learn that much more better than, uh, than when, you, when, you, when, you, when, you, when you when you just do some translations. So for course design and for curriculum design, it, is, it, it, it may uh, play an important role. You can compare programs with each other. What do I, what, what, in this summer course, what do I learn there? And, uh, okay. and of course, uh, uh, teaching the teacher is one of the elements too. So, what, uh, so in, in order to, 
to overcome this, uh, this master pupil model, I think we need to, uh, to teach the teacher. The future is, uh, will, well, the future has already begun because we have this uh, Petra E network. Uh, I think we have some 21, uh, 21 members uh, till now. How many? 20, 21, yes. And I think there, there will be many more this year. I, I hope so. And we can, uh, in this network, we, we meet once a year. The next meeting will be in October in uh, Budapest. Uh, and we exchange experiences and, uh, and uh, uh, try to develop the things that are still needed uh, uh, in, the, in the framework. So we try to improve it and to develop uh, online training. That's, that's a very important point. Yeah? One of the ideals would be that we have an, uh, an online, an online uh, uh, a site where you can click on one of the descriptors and then the menu falls open and uh, you see, okay, when, when I have this problem, what can I do? What, what uh, we, we can refer to, to, uh, to research or we can refer to other uh, 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 people having the same uh, problem or uh, experiences, uh, exercises even, yeah, uh, online, yeah. So that's, uh, that's one of the big things and I hope also a bibliography of uh, uh, when it comes to, the, to this problem. Uh, it could also be an online broker of courses for translators. So that's, uh, that's one of the ideas. So it's, uh, where, 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 where do I find the, the course that is needed for my problems? Some people are talking about certification and, uh, and offering a Petra level, uh, a label. But I think I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat reluctant uh, to do that because uh, when, when you want to do that, you, you need really a strong uh, 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 way of assessing uh, uh, people as well as, uh, as institutions. And as long as we haven't uh, developed that in a reliable uh, and valid sense, I, I think we shouldn't do it. Or only in, in a very general way and I don't know what it means then to have a Petra certification. Okay, but, uh, what is it? It's just uh, a name then. We have a website but it's, it's still very primitive. Uh, we are, uh, I think uh, somebody is working on it now uh, since last week uh, and you can visit it uh, uh, perhaps. Well, some shortcomings. Uh, for me, this, uh, the framework is not really a framework, it is a list. It is a list of competencies and it's an open list. You can add some and you can, you can leave out some uh, descriptors. Or, so it's, it's a list. And this learning line, um, in, is it compatible with the idea of competence? In a learning line, you develop uh, through several stages, several level, levels, but as I said, competencies are dichotomously uh, uh, scorable. You have them or you don't have them. So that's, that's, there's a certain tension between this developing uh, moment in a learning line and having a competence or not having a competence, you see? We discussed on that and, and perhaps in a, in a, in a learning environment, you can, you can say, you are, yes, you are developing a competence yeah? and you may be less competent than another. That's the question. Can, can you be less competent? Is being less competent competent? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, there are no behavioral indicators in our framework and there's no evaluation system yet. Uh, and that's, well, uh, a competence is a proven uh, competence. It's always, uh, you, have, you, have, you have to prove, you have to demonstrate that you have it, okay? It must be measurable, in fact. So we need valid and reliable tests. Then, in order to develop, especially these online uh, courses and or, or, or uh, possibilities, 126 descriptors may be too much, I don't, I don't know. It's, it's, it makes things very, very complicated. It's, it's a lot. 
and I think we, we have to look at EMT when, when they think 35 is enough or when we initially thought that 56 was enough, that, that would be easier, I think. Okay, but then there are some shortcomings in the formulation. I think that uh, the scriptus should have the format of a can-do statement. Most of them have, but uh, uh, some don't. So for example, in LT5, you have in competence one, you have as a descriptor, optimal creative ability. So what does it mean? Okay. Uh, also this word uh, optimal that's already the second, the second point optimal uh, is a word that indicates some gradation okay and I, I think you should, you should uh, enter that into a, in, into a competence framework or uh, LT3 develops ability to find solutions and make choices beyond learned procedures and methods okay it's nice but it's not a can-do statement <laughs> I agree that the, that, that the a competent translator must, must do that, but uh, the formulation is not right. Or specializes in at least one specific genre. Uh, it is not a can-do statement. And another shortcoming is that some of the descriptors uh, contain uh, gradations or fuzzy semantic distinctions, uh, which I don't understand. I don't know the difference uh, for example, between can adopt translation strategies appropriately in LT2 competence one and in LT3 can apply strategies in a purposeful way. So the semantic difference between appropriately and purposeful, what, what, what does it mean? No, I, I, don't, I don't see it. No? When, you, when you use it appropriately, I suppose it will be, it will be purposeful too, okay? Or the other way around. Let me come to Petra E and uh, Bible translation. As, as James said already, I have, I have some experience. I, 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 I'm not a Bible translator myself, uh, but I have had some experience. I do understand some Greek, especially the Bible Greek. It's, it's not a problem for me, but I don't, uh, I don't speak Hebrew. Uh, um, but I was a, a member of this Flemish uh, reader panel for the new Bible translation. We had to uh, we had to read, I, I read all the texts together with five, six other people. And uh, the, the point was that uh, the Bible translation was made in Holland and uh, Dutch and Flemish are in fact the same language, but uh, they use other words. They, we understand it, but, but we, we, we know immediately that it, that it is Dutch and not Flemish. So our, uh, our, our goal was uh, to skip all the words that were too Dutch and, or that were only Dutch and uh, so it had to be general Dutch. That was a nice experience, I must say. We read all these texts very, very carefully and uh, it was very good. So we were some kind of a gatekeeper, I think they, they call that, hmm? in, uh, in Bible translation. And, uh, and I uh, wrote this uh, history of Dutch Bible translation in the 19th century. I think there is uh, there's really a connection between literary translation and uh, Bible translation. Uh, you, you, can, you can really discuss that. Uh, not only uh, in sense of sensitive, both are sensitive texts. You know? When you change something to it, okay, it's, it's sensitive in, in some way or another. Okay? And for me, that's, that's, that was for me, in fact, uh, because I, I wasn't engaged in this for religious re reasons, just for, uh, I was interested in translation. And for me, uh, Bible translation is very interesting because, uh, in, in their, because of their status of uh, sensitive texts, I think that uh, Bible texts resist instrumentalization, resist uh, the, these, this instrumental concept of, uh, of translation, which says, give me the text and I'll do something with it. I think the uh, uh, Bible texts, in their status as sensitive text, or even in their status as sacred text, resist against this putting your hands on it and doing something with it, as in these functional approaches to translation. 
So I, I agree to what uh, Phil was uh, telling us uh, last Friday, so uh, very much you know, so in this resistance towards uh, an uh, instrumental uh, uh, concept of translation. But when you read this book, uh, Bible translation, Frames of Reference by Timothy Wilt, here the philosophy is totally instrumental. So uh, that's, that's, that's funny, okay? Uh, and they, they talk about every aspect of, uh, of uh, Bible translation. So uh, scripture translation in the era of translation studies, translation and communication, the role of culture in Bible translation, linguistic theory and their relevance to Bible translation. And there's a huge essay by Ernst Wendland, A Literary Approach to Biblical Texts. Uh, it's, uh, it's, and that's, that's, of course, our point. But also he is uh, approaching these texts as, um, as, as objects that you can handle, that you can, that you can put your hands on and... Uh, and distinguish procedures and techniques and literary, uh, okay, th that's okay. But I, I have always some doubt uh, when it comes to that. Okay, so uh, still I think uh, uh, when we have this question of can this uh, uh, framework be adopted to, for, for Bible translation, I think yes, that can be done a lot. Yeah? There are, of course, some differences uh, 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 in Bible translation. This, I think my experience is that Bible translations are really highly organized uh, projects, at least the one that I got to know. I brought these two things with you. These are the guidelines, yeah? the guidelines for the, for the new Dutch Bible translation. So I had, to, I, have to, I had to read it all. Imagine a literary translator uh, reading uh, some 200 pages before he can start translating. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's not done, okay? okay. There's also this, this qu in, in literary translator, translation, you have mostly a connection between the translator and the publisher, okay? And this publisher, he knows nothing about translation, but perhaps he will tell the translator, okay, this, this, this doesn't read very, very, very good, change it, or something like that. But, but uh, in, in Bible translation, you have organizations, you have gatekeepers, you have financers, you have the, the whole framing of the, of the project. And these, these people, they, perhaps they will tell you how to do it. And uh, that's, that's a difference in, uh, in, in literary translation. It's more individual. And which is very interesting for me, the, dif the difference between interpretation of a literary text and the exegesis of a, of a biblical text. So both are forms of, uh, of explanation of the text, but still very, very different. So you, in, in an interpretation, you want, you, you want a consistent meaning of, of the literary text. And in an exegesis, you want to say the theological truth of a text. That's a, that's a different goal. And uh, in, the, in the Dutch Bible translation, the, 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 the way of doing was that a translator was always uh, connected to an, to an uh, exegesis. And, and they, they, they were translating together. Uh, there were couples, they, were, uh, they, they weren't working alone. There, there were two or three, uh, sometimes three people when the text was very difficult, and one translator and uh, t uh, one or two, uh, how you call it in English? Uh, exegetes, yes. Okay. You can't imagine a literary translator uh, uh, sitting there and uh, next to him, someone who explains him what the text uh, uh, means it's, uh, so it's uh, you can't imagine that so uh, <laughs> a literary translator is is the uh, interpreter of, of the text that's uh, different in, in Bible translation but, but you know. so I thought uh, uh, I've, I've been thinking on, on the basis uh, of this uh, what competence is and this is only a proposal I, I will finish with that um, 
what, what competencies uh, could be uh, important for Bible translators? Uh, first of all, I think this, this framing competence, or, or how should I say, the, 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 the need for, for a Bible translator to be conscious of, of the fact that he is working within a frame uh, that is, uh, it can be a religious frame, a social cultural frame, organizational frame, or a communicative frame. Of course, you have the language competence, the level of mastering biblical languages, and the level of mastering the target language in grammar, style, and pragmatics. I think the heuristic competence uh, is, is also there. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, similar. Uh -huh. It's, it's even better developed in, in uh, Bible science than in, uh, than in literary uh, uh, context. Uh, text critique and historical critique, it's, 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 it's all developed very well. You know, this material knowledge, uh, archaeological knowledge, is, uh, is becoming uh, increasingly uh, important. I think also this textual uh, competence. One, one of, the, uh, one of the, the guidelines in the Dutch Bible translation was that biblical texts are texts like every other text. That, that, so they, they, they didn't care about uh, sensitive or not. Uh, biblical texts are texts like, like any other text. And they were considered as literary texts. So there were, after the translation, there was uh, a, a literary uh, a critique. Yes, uh, someone who looked at the literary quality of the text. So. Uh, you have to know something about genres, about coherence and cohesion, about intertextuality, archetypes, concordance, and other literary techniques. And then this hermeneutical or exegetical competence, the, the way of assigning meaning or detecting the theological truths, uh, well, there's, there's some tension. Uh, and the, and the big question is, is a translation already an exegesis or is it providing material for exegesis? Also that is, uh, uh, we have to decide. The transfer competence, maybe you notice, I, I think there's some hierarchy in this, uh, <laughs> in this order. Yeah? Uh, this, the transfer competence, I think, can be copied uh, from, from our framework. And then these, these evaluation competence, is it needed? Or, and this research competence, do, do we need it in, in Bible translation? So I think there's, there's, uh, there's room for an adaptation or, and, and, and uh, also for, a, it could be a, a critical approach to this uh, and, and to make a, even a better framework than we have now, okay? That was it. Thank you very much. <laughs>